right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, thank you so much for uh, bringing us to this very last week of this semester. Um, thank you for uh, giving us so many blessings in life. And I pray that you use uh, this class as a means of grace in our lives to uh, make us love you more and love other people more, uh, to believe more of your promises in your word. I pray that use this class as a, a means of grace to give us a better understanding of the glorious, elegant meta narrative of Scripture. I pray that you would use this class to increase our faith. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we pray with your people in the past and say, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name. Uh, be glory. Uh, would you answer uh, these prayers, uh, not because we're good people or uh, understand things better than others, but would you answer our prayers because the Lord Jesus has lived the perfect life in our place and has died uh, for our sins? Um, would you answer our prayers for his sake? We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we're at the very last week of this semester. I never thought that we would make it this far face to face, but uh, we have. And so uh, uh, praise to God's uh, blessing there. Uh, please take the attendance quiz, attendance quiz uh, 38 in bright space. Remember that if you have to take the final exam, the final exam is Monday, November 23rd, 8 to 10. It'll be in this room. Um, if you have to miss that date for some reason, you can schedule the final exam earlier, uh, but it will need to be completed um, uh, in the Academic Success Center before um, uh, the time of the regularly scheduled exam. Uh, as always, remember, uh, if you haven't come by to say your verses, please uh, come by anytime my uh, door is open. You're welcome to come in. It takes about five minutes. That is 15% of your final grade, and so you don't want to just uh, skip that. Even if you can't say it perfectly, uh, if you can say some of it, you'll get some points uh, out of that uh, 15%. And remember, you're exempt from the final if uh, you've either physically been here or if you had a reason uh, to be absent, if you've made that up by watching the lecture. Uh, if you have an A average on the 28 homework assignments, I do apologize for any confusion that that uh, is given. I think I said it in a way that was prone to be misunderstood, but uh, we basically have met together 40 times, and out of those 40 times, you need uh, 28 uh, homework assignments. If you're missing one or two, um, the one we'll do on Wednesday uh, will be the kingdom of God. If you just go through and look at the kingdom of God and write up a summary of what you find, I'll uh, use that to replace one of the uh, homework one of the 28 uh, homework assignments if you have a zero on that. And uh, Friday, if uh, you need to make up more than one, uh, we're going to be studying for the final exam, kind of take a um, step back and take a whole semester long look at what we've uh, learned. And so if you want to uh, make up a homework assignment there, you can uh, just step back and say, this is what I've learned in the uh, uh, 40 times that we were together. Uh, so you'll need to 28 homework assignments at eight, an A average, and you need to score 90% or better on the memory verses. So if uh, you uh, tick those three boxes, then you don't have to take the final. You will have earned an A uh, for the class. So um, I encourage you to avail yourself of, of that if possible. So uh, today we're going to 
finish up our discussion of preterism. And when I say preterism, uh, you know I mean partial preterism, that is some preteristic elements in the eschatological discourse and revelation. We'll look at the uh, arguments for futurism and why so many people find that to be the right way to understand these texts. And then I want to step back and ask, well, what does it matter? Um, if, if you can be a Christian and you uh, can come down on different places, uh, why, why should we even uh, worry about it? So uh, just to finish up the final two arguments for uh, some kind of view of preterism in Revelation, and, uh, of an argument, a uh, powerful argument, is that uh, the book of Revelation is vengeance against apostate Jerusalem. And um, how this argument uh, will go is something like this. Then the third angel pointed, poured out his uh, bowl into the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. In other words, um, the enemy of God here is being treated like Egypt was treated. Uh, and I heard an angel of the water saying, Righteous you are who are and who were, O holy one, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints, and they poured out the blood of the prophets. Well, if you... Uh, recall from your reading of the Bible, um, Jesus is pretty clear that a prophet must perish in Jerusalem. Um, all the prophets were perishing in Jerusalem. And if the enemy of God is being punished for shedding the blood of the prophets, then how is that not vengeance against Jerusalem? Um you could say, well, there are New Testament prophets like Agabus, and that's true. And it's clear that many people died in Rome, and that's true. Um, but you, you are having to kind of dismiss the fact that elsewhere in the Bible, prophets die in Jerusalem. Um, so some will uh, forward this as evidence, even strong evidence that what's being spoken of is not the destruction of Rome, but rather the destruction of Jerusalem. And if Revelation is not about the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, I want you to think about this argument for a minute. If Revelation is not about the destruction of Jerusalem, then God passes over apostate Judaism without any threat of judgment. If it is about the destruction of Jerusalem, then God is bringing the covenant curses of Deuteronomy 29 on the Jews who reject his plan. Um, in a, other words, if there aren't at least some preteristic elements in the eschatological discourse in Mark 13 and parallels and some preteristic elements in Revelation, then the New Testament does not say one word about God judging apostate Judaism for crucifying Jesus. That seems astonishing if that were the case. But if there are preteristic elements in uh, Mark 13 and preteristic elements in Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation, then God is saying, you rejected my way of grace, and this is punishment for rejecting the grace in Jesus. Another and a final argument um, that we should think about in all this and this is an argument we looked at in um, our discussion of Mark 13, and it's the phrase, this generation. Uh, truly, truly, I say this, that this generation will not 
pass away until all these things take place. And we pointed out that Jesus died uh, on Passover day in 38 D and uh, Jerusalem was destroyed 40 years and six months later uh, on Yom Kippur. That seems like a fair interpretation of this generation. But an argument that I omitted when we talked about that section is this grammatical fact. Um, in Greek, the phrase this generation is this hey genea alte, which is the feminine nominative singular of uh, this phrase, this generation. So this phrase, this generation, hey, genea, how te, um, how you say this generation in Greek, that's the word that appears. The problem is that same exact phrase appears in the accusative case less than a chapter away and Jesus is speaking to those who are opposing him, the scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus says to that group of people standing before him in Matthew uh, 23, he says, uh, truly, I say to you, all these things will come on Tain Ganean Tautain, and that may not look like it's the same phrase, but if I write it in uh, the nominative case, it's hey, genea, haute, same three words, same three or uh, same order. Uh, the cases are different because in Greek, uh, the function in the sentence uh, determines its case, but I find it difficult to believe that the same three words in the same order um, can mean something like this race of people will uh, not pass away until all these things uh, come about, which is the way you would have to interpret it under a futuristic uh, when the exact same phrase in the exact same order and the exact same three words are used by Jesus to a group of people who were berating him. And he said to that group of people, everything that I've just said is going to happen uh, to you. That seems very difficult to explain away that that isn't talking somehow about the destruction in 70 AD. And uh, Jesus is saying all these things, and um, he's saying all these things, uh, panta tauta, all these things, uh, and panta tauta, different order there, but the same two words. How, how can that refer to d different things? But if he's saying to the people who opposed, um, uh, you're going to see this judgment come, and it's going to come before this generation dies. And the whole quote, just read it in English, so that upon you may fall all the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. That seems like Jesus is saying 40 years from now, um, and God will settle uh, uh, what you're about to do. So what about the arguments about 96 AD? So we've, um, and I presented them as best I could. Um, I want to do that for both sides. Uh, but what about the arguments for 96 AD? Why do so many people date the book of Revelation from uh, the time of Domitian. Well, this is the reason. Uh, Irenaeus, he's an early church father. He wrote a, a wonderful book called Against Heresies, and uh, he's in a life and death struggle. Christianity 
is with uh, Gnosticism. And he's the one who turned the tide, who saved the church from falling into Gnostic heresy. He is a godly man, and he wrote wonderful uh, things. And this is what he writes about uh, the book of Revelation, and he's writing this in 180 AD. This is what Irenaeus says. We will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of the Antichrist. If we went and read the entire quote, he looks at some options that have been forwarded for the Antichrist. And Irenaeus says, we will not uh, risk pronouncing positively as the name of the Antichrist, for if it were ne uh, necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the ap uh, apocalyptic vision. In other words, Irenaeus is saying if John wanted us to know that, he would have told us what the name is. And then he adds this statement, for what was seen uh, no very long time since, but almost in our own time, toward the end of Domitian's reign. And Domitian reigned, he died in 96 AD. So Irenaeus is saying, when was the book written? And Irenaeus is saying it was written in Domitian's time. And uh, there were people, um, very prominently a man named Papias, uh, who claimed to be a personal disciple of John, or at least may be claiming that. And he's saying this is what John taught about 50 years after Papias. Uh, Irenaeus is saying, look, uh, John wrote, and it was almost within the, you know, just a life, one person's lifetime away, and he wrote in Domitian's reign. And if that's the right interpretation of this passage, then this is very, very, very strong evidence uh, that we should date the uh, book to 96 uh, AD. Some very good scholars will even say, when you go and look at the internal evidence, yes, you can make a very strong uh, case for Nero's date, uh, but uh, the early tradition is just too one-sided to accept what uh, looks like the internal argument. There are some scholars who say that uh, John is writing in 96, but he's writing as if he were uh, in uh, Nero's day. There are some who suggest that there are two versions of Revelation, uh, one pre-Nero and one post. When you step back and look at all of that, the primary evidence that people are trying to wrestle with is the fact of this pretty clear um uh, expression by Irenaeus to say it was written in Domitian's time. Now, having said that, we are talking about something that was written in Latin, and there are people who uh, say that the it that's implied right here is not it, but rather uh, it's John. And if you know anything about Latin, it works exactly the way Greek works. That's completely a possibility uh, grammatically. That's not how most people have interpreted it. Most people interpret it saying the book was written in Domitian's age, but this is the evidence. This is kind of the cornerstone that people uh, will build off of. And if we go to our current study Bibles, very good uh, NIV Zondervan study Bible, and it's been rebranded as the biblical theology study Bible, this is their note about the date. Ancient and modern interpreters have typically dated Revelation to the reigns of Nero, 54 to 68, or to Domitian, 81 to 96. Those preferring an earlier date appeal particularly to 1710 and the, uh, identify the five fallen kings as Julius Caesar, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and the one who is, is Nero. They often interpret 11, uh, 1 through 2 as predicting that Rome will destroy the temple in 70 and take 13, 3 as referring to the popular legend about Nero's return that circulated after its, 
his death. That's what the NIV study Bible says, but notice what they add. Uh, and th this is absolutely true. They're being, uh, the study Bible is being completely fair with the evidence and says most interpreters, most interpreters date Revelation to AD 95 or 96 following Irenaeus's statement that John received his vision toward the end of Domitian's reign, book five of the heresies, against heresies. John addresses Christian in Asia Minor who are facing pressure to participate in Roman religious practices, particularly emperor worship. Um, so what's the majority view? The majority view clearly sides with Irenaeus. And if we go to the ESV study Bible, uh, they write a similar note, but a bit more strongly worded, for they say, Irenaeus reports on the basis of earlier sources that John received the revelation almost in our own time toward the end of the reign of Domitian. Since Domitian's reign ended in 96, most scholars date Revelation in the mid-90s. Some, however, have argued for a date during Nero's reign, uh, 54 to 68, and before the fall of Jerusalem, basing their conclusion in part on the belief that Revelation 11, 1 and 2 is a predictive prophecy of Romans, the Roman siege and destruction of earthly Jerusalem during the Jewish war. Then the ESV study Bible continues. However, conditions in the churches of chapters two and three and their cities favor a date in 95 through 96. In other words, uh, when you go and look what these seven churches are facing, then the evidence shifts from favoring a Neronian date to a Domitianic date. Uh, so argues the ESV study Bible. And in Revelation, the holy city does not seem to refer to earthly Jerusalem. Uh, so the, those who follow Nero's, the Neronian date, are going to say 11, 1, and 2 is about Jerusalem. And the ESV study Bible is saying, no, that may not be the case. Assuming the later date, uh, events relating to Nero's reign and Jerusalem's destruction, both of which would now have been uh, passed, are woven into John's visions as portents and prototypes of present pressures and coming traumas in the world's assault on Christ's church. So we've seen that the two primary study Bibles that are used by evangelicals today, the NIV study Bible and the ESV study Bible, both side with Irenaeus saying that we should uh, favor a Domitianic uh, date. And this is the argument that uh, emperor worship is being uh, prohibited. And you can see all these passages that talk about worshiping the beast. And um, the argument is that historically, worshiping the emperor did not come about until Domitian's reign. And so if you're talking about worshiping the beast, uh, which all these verses talk about worshiping the beast, that did not happen until Domitian's time and Domitian dies in 96 uh, AD. Uh, those who would favor Nero's day would point out that Antiochus Epiphanes had um, required uh, worship uh, two centuries before Christ. Uh, was born. He wasn't a, a Roman emperor, but he was a world ruler. Uh, many will argue that Domitian's persecutions, the Domitianic persecution of the church, was very intense. And uh, you can see from these verses that the uh, persecution of the church uh, is being described as very intense. However, that argument is um, an argument that cut both cuts both ways, because if you know your history, uh, Nero, when he set fire to Rome, he was trying to uh, get some houses for development of his palace, and he ended up burning uh, Rome half down. Uh, you may remember that he accused Christians of uh, incest and cannibalism 
because of their love feast, quote unquote. It's really odd that a man who um, was in love with his sister and his mother would accuse Christians of incest. Uh, but the cannibalism, uh, the you know, picking up on the Lord's Supper, uh, you may know that the result of that were, were the Neronian persecutions where he burned Christians alive in his garden and invited uh, people to come party while uh, the Christians were being burned alive. So uh, that sounds like pretty intense persecution in Nero's time as well, but many will forward that the Domitianic persecutions are, um, imp- are empire-wide, and that, that may be uh, the case. So these verses talk about a persecution in Asia Minor, and if this is a valid argument, then this would be another reason to go with the 96 date. Another reason to go with the 96 date would be connecting the great whore with Rome. And if you just read through uh, kind of a plain language view of Revelation, um, then Babylon, Babylon and Rome are an easy connection uh, to make and, you know, rules over all the kings of the earth. That sounds a lot more like Rome than it does uh, Jerusalem. The problem with that argument, though, is this verse in chapter 11 where it says the body of uh, hey, polis, hey, megale, the city, the great one, where it spells out figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. Well, if it's figuratively called that, could it not also be called Babylon? But then this puts it beyond all um, debate where also there Lord was crucified. Um, I mean, the ESV study Bible is saying um, uh, the great city. Uh, Let's see, where was it? Um, The great city or the holy city is not Jerusalem. I'm not finding that, but it seems to me that 11.8, unless Jesus was crucified somewhere other than the Gospels say, then he was crucified in Jerusalem. So how can the city in 11 not be Jerusalem? But if, if there's a way to separate this verse from these, then I think absolutely it would favor Uh, the argument for Rome. Um, I'm just a little unsure how you use the same phrase um, for both these, and they're two different uh, things. What we can say that all Christians agree on, though, is this. The New Testament teaches that Jesus will visibly, bodily return and judge this world. That's crystal clear in Acts 1. The same way Jesus left, you will see him return to judge the world. And secondly, what all Christians agree with, whether you take partial preterism or futurism, is that we must watch and live our lives out accordingly because that return could be any time and it could be today. So. You, you've kind of seen that um, the argument for a Neronian date is an argument that goes to the text of Revelation and says, look, all these things seem to point to a Neronian date. Um, the, the argument um, for the Domitianic date is the overwhelming uh, voice of church history that would say, This was written in uh, the time of Domitian. What I appreciate about Bryan College is that many 
um, Christian schools uh, have sided with um, almost exclusively futuristic interpretation of um, uh, the eschatological discourses and revelation to the extent that it's in their doctrinal um, confession. Um, that's true of many, many evangelical uh, Christian schools in America. Uh, Brian chose not to do that. So Brian's uh, statement of faith says we believe that Christ will return. Um, we believe in the blessed hope of Christ returning, uh, quoting Second uh, Thessalonians. But beyond that, um, uh, Brian has chosen not to uh, take a position. Um, what I can say personally about that is I really appreciate Brian doing that uh, because I have to admit when I come to the data, I don't know which of these views is right. I, I tend to go with the more preteristic uh, interpretation. And when I applied to teach at Brian College, um, so many Christian colleges had looked at uh, my being unclear on that is kind of excluding me from being able to teach at uh, pretty conservative uh, places. And you guys have spent uh, almost 40 sessions with me. You know, I'm a pretty conservative <laughs> person uh, theologically. And uh, when Brian advertised their position, I, I did not even apply because I thought I'm going to be excluded because I'm you know, at least entertain the possibility of some preteristic elements. And so uh, before I applied, I sent an email and I said, this is what I believe. Uh, I spelled it out as clearly as I could. And I said, does that exclude me from Bryan College? And I was um, very appreciative uh, when Cal White, the academic uh, uh, dean at that time, emailed me back and said, no, uh, as long as you believe that Jesus uh, will come back uh, visibly, um, and beyond that, uh, Brian doesn't take a position. And so I have to say, as uh, someone who's struggled with kind of these things, that I really appreciate that about Brian College, that uh, Brian College believes uh, that you're smart enough uh, we present all the evidence and you're smart enough to make up your own mind. And uh, I appreciate schools that have done that. Uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School did that for me because I was able to change my mind about um, something and that was okay. Um, um, and Trinity is very good about doing that, saying these are the views and um, we trust you to decide. This is what all um, Christians agree on. Um, and I can say I agree with this absolutely 100%. Um, I'm less sure that what Mark 13 is talking about is this. I think Mark 13 may be talking about uh, Jesus coming in judgment in 70 AD, but I don't know. Uh, You've seen the evidence that I've seen. Um, uh, you make up your own mind. This is what Orthodox Christianity believes. This is what the statement of faith that Brian uh, says. And uh, I think fairly this is what uh, everyone throughout uh, church history has believed. Um, beyond that, there's much less agreement. Um, so what does it matter and where should we go? from here? Well, the difference, the differences have to do with, uh, will there be an ultimate transformation on earth? Um, so I don't know if you realize during this talk, um, but the four main views, uh, historic premillennialism, dispensational premillennialism, both suppose that there's going to be a massive kind of devolution of the church, an apostasy, and then when it gets really, really bad, Jesus is going to come back. 
Amillennialism and postmillennialism don't believe that. Uh, postmillennialism, and most people who embrace some form of preterism end up being postmillennialists. Postmillennialists believe that there will be an ultimate transformation of the church, uh, of the world, in fact. Uh, postmillennialists believe that um, the godly effect of Christians on the earth will eventually transform uh, the earth itself to where the line will lay down with the land. Um, so this typically is where you end up. If you take a more futurist uh, view, you're expecting uh, coming days of great tribulation uh, and coming days of great apostasy, and then Christ will return uh, to fix everything. On amillennialism and postmillennialism, th there may be elements of this, but you're expecting a transformation uh, that uh, Christianity, the piety of Christianity, is eventually going to win. Those have been allowed within Orthodox Christianity, but people have been committed to one side or the other, uh, the same way that people are committed to the mode and uh, uh, the mode and um, persons of baptism. So uh, there are people who say, hey, we side here, we side here, uh, but that doesn't make you unchristian if you decide one side or the other. So these are the differences. These are the same. All Christians agree on this. All Christians don't agree on this, uh, what that means. Now, just to kind of round out this um, um, discussion, how many of you have ever heard anybody talk about who are the 144,000? Okay. Me too. I've heard all kinds of people ask that question. How many have ever asked who the 24,000 are? The 288,000, because this is a list that's given eight times in scripture, the fighting people in um, Israel at the beginning of the Exodus, at the end of the Exodus, in First Chronicles, and then under David. How many have ever asked why in the 144,000 the tribe of Dan is omitted. Nobody ever asked those questions, at least that I've seen, because everyone wants to know the answer to this question, but they don't want to study these passages. That seems wrong to me. Uh, if this list of these numbers of the fighting men occur, why shouldn't we ask what they mean elsewhere before we come to the final one? Why is it that Ephraim is omitted and replaced with Joseph? Why is it that Levi, who is omitted here, is included in the list in Revelation? For it seems to me, if we want to know who the 144,000 are, we should ask, how do these numbers relate to the other number list um, in the Bible? And so many uh, teachers of God's word will say, uh, skip this. Uh, don't study that at all. Don't worry about this. But here's my view. And, you know, I need a new Learjet. So send me some. Oh, sorry. That was wicked of me to say. <laughs> But that's usually how it works, isn't it? Uh, people go for the last one, but they never want to. And I do apologize for that. I, I can have such a wicked, sharp tongue. And um, one day Jesus is going to cure me of that, and it's going to be a great day. I'm going to be a much nicer person to talk to because I don't say s stuff like that. So I apologize. But the point, the point is, 
if you want to know what this is, you probably should look at this. You should, probably should take time because it may give a better answer. And why is it that Dan is omitted in Revelation's list? And why, when uh, the camp is outlined in Revelation, why is it different from this? I mean, what's happening to this New Jerusalem? Uh, why are the lists being um, changed somehow? And it seems to me if you want to know the answer to that question, you're going to have to look and write it down and ask and say, well, well, wh why is it? Another thing we might do is why these seven churches? Uh, why is it that some churches, their problems against the churches, others not problems. Why is it that some churches have a threat and others don't have a threat? And why do some churches have notes and some don't have notes? It seems to me if we want to know what this book is about, we have to dive into this and see. I think one thing that helped me understand part of what's going on is just the list. Uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Um, this is the Isle of Patmos. Uh, this is the harbor in Ephesus. Um, Patmos is wh where you sent criminals to... Um, work in the mines, John's in Patmos. Uh, why these seven churches? Well, when you look at the highway system, it's pretty clear. Delivered the first one, he sailed to the second one. He delivered the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, and the sixth one. But the or the seventh one, and the seventh one is really near Paul's church at Colossae. Why these seven? Well, maybe these seven represent the kind of challenges that face every church in every age. Uh, and maybe God is using that um, to teach us something. And just in the seven minutes, uh, uh, we have left. Is there a reason for hopefulness in the way we look at the eschaton? Well, uh, if the Domitianic date is right, then uh, we are headed to a great tribulation. We are headed to a time of great apostasy and great uh, judgment. Are there any verses that would point in the other direction? Well, there are a few. Um, uh, Genesis 1, 27, 28, God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every living thing that creeps on the ground. Well, uh, let me skip forward. I have these in the wrong order. We'll come back to it. Um, this is the verse. And what's clear about this word, God said to them, these imperatives in Hebrew are given to the man and his wife. This one's written defectively, but it's plural as well. God is telling them, rule over. So here's a question. If Jesus, as the last Adam, came to set right all the first Adam got wrong, would you expect him to, to fulfill this? If Jesus is the second Adam and the first Adam failed, then would you expect him to do this right? And I think everyone would say yes. Well, is the new Adam married to a new Eve? 
in the Bible. Ephesians 5, 31 says, For this cause man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then Paul says, I'm telling you, this refers to Christ and the church. So it's clear that Jesus is married to the church. So here's the question. If the first command was to the man and his wife, would you expect the fulfillment in Jesus would include or exclude his wife? I think it would include. I think the two of them would be fruitful. The two of them would multiply. The two of them would fill the earth. The two of them would subdue it. The two of them would rule over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. And who's the creepiest creep of them all? It would be the creeping serpent. Would you expect her to to triumph on the world, or would you expect her not to triumph? When we talk about Daniel 24, and we saw in the whole um, passage of the uh, weeks, look at what is promised uh, to bring an end to rebellion, to stop sin. And we saw this phrase, holy of holies. And we saw how the English translations uh, equated that with the temple. And that's true. This occurs of the holy of holies uh, tons of times in scripture. It's also true that it describes Aaron in scripture, uh, who's the high priest. And it's also true that in Daniel 9.24, in the Hebrew, this is what it literally says, the time to, that's what this word means. And then I'm just going to read this word out loud and you tell me what it means. To Messiah, a holy of holies. Have you ever heard that word before? to Messiah something? Uh, Does that look like the founding of a temple or does that look like the coming of a new high priest? I I don't know. You decide. Hopeful verses, ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance, the very ends of the earth. You will rule over them. Should we expect a day when Christ rules in Iraq, in Jordan, in Syria, in the secular universities of Germany, and the secular universities of America. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Is the trafficking of persons in America an enemy of Jesus. It looks to me like God is promising to subdue those enemies to Christ. You will rule. If we had time, it's probably the tribe there will rule. Paul, when he quotes it, adds a word until he, until he has put all his enemies as a footstool. That doesn't sound like a great collapse uh, of Christianity to me. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters fill the sea. Well, how do the waters cover the sea? They completely cover the sea. So could we expect that the knowledge of the glory of God will completely? And someone might say, hey, you're over interpreting that. The sea only covers seven-eighths of the earth. Okay, I'll settle for seven-eighths. It looks like a pretty helpful promise of the increase of his kingdom 
there will be no end. That seems very hopeful to me. So what I want you to do is be a Berean. You know the arguments, you know the evidence, you go look, you decide for yourself. And I'll see you on Wednesday.